I'm thrilled to be here this morning at the Wildlife Summit and to be among so many people who truly share my passion for Idaho's wildlife and an understanding of what wildlife means to our recreation, enjoyment, wonder, and way of life here in Idaho. I want to thank the Department of Fish and Game and the Fish and Game Commission for taking this initiative to bring about this summit. I, for one, appreciate the invitation to be part of this discussion, and I look forward to hearing the diverse ideas and views of how we can tackle some of the challenges that lie ahead for wildlife in our state. It is the right time and the right forum to engage and begin this very important conversation. As an Idaho native, I grew up on a farm south of Kimberly, where nature and wildlife were literally right in your backyard. Whether it was riding horses in the South Hills, hunting and fishing in the nearby streams and reservoirs and stubble fields, I was exposed to wildlife from an early age and in a variety of settings. Both sides of my family, the Starks and Joneses, enjoyed fishing, and at a young age, I learned that a good portion of each summer's vacation would be getting involved, getting up at pitch black, going and loading into one of my grandparents' campers, and heading off with them for multiple days of fishing. I loved both sets of my grandparents, and in general, they seemed to get along well enough with each other. But there was always this tension between the sets of grandparents that I could never quite put my finger on. I knew that we never all fished together, and that puzzled me. So as I was sitting there in my lawn chair one day, fishing with my grandma and grandpa Jones, probably a little bored after hours of casting and reeling in repeatedly, with no doubt my grandpa saying over and over again, Tony, just let it sit for a while. I naively looked up at my grandparents and I said, Grandma and Grandpa, we should go fishing with Grandpa Stark sometime. The silence that followed thought me, made me think maybe they hadn't heard me. <laughs> then I looked up to see them exchanging glances with each other. And my normally gregarious grandpa said in a serious and hushed tone, as if he was worried somebody might overhear, Tony, we are trout fishermen. Your grandpa Stark is, well, a cat fisherman. <laughs> there it was, the source of tension between the families. I finally understood. We were a family divided. Trout fisherman or cat fisherman, choose your side. But as you can see from this photo, I chose my own path. And just like Virgil, apparently it was that of carp fishermen. <laughs> On a more serious note, while this may have been my first, it was not my last experience of learning how we can be inadvertently be masters of putting people into categories, labeling them, and working really hard to find the differences that separate us versus focusing and finding the commonalities that we all share. Over the years, I have learned that we can accomplish a great deal more by focusing on what we do share, such as a desire to protect water, native species, wildlife, and our rich Idaho heritage for our children and grandchildren. So often, we are surprised to find out what those commonalities are that we share. For instance, some people are surprised that someone who grew up on a farm from Kimberly, Idaho, surrounded by hunting and fishing, would work for the Nature Conservancy. Others are surprised to know that over 70% of our Idaho Nature Conservancy staff are avid hunters and anglers. That is because of the age-old temptation to put people into categories, either trout fishermen or cat fishermen. In fact, the Nature Conservancy is made up of a very diverse group of people. We come from different backgrounds, origins, and locales. But what we share is a 100% commitment to the conservation of wildlife and the landscapes that are critical to their survival. The Nature Conservancy is one of the world's largest conservation organizations with over one million members. We operate in all 50 states and in 33 countries. Our mission is to protect the lands and waters on which all life depends. The organization has protected more than 119 million acres and 5,000 miles of rivers worldwide. 
In Idaho, the Conservancy has protected more than 400,000 acres. This is land that provides critical habitat for wildlife and increased public access for activities including angling, hunting, hiking, or wildlife watching. Our conservation methods are scientifically based and our approach is collaborative and non-confrontational. Idaho's wildlife are facing unprecedented threats. Foremost is the loss of habitat. To have healthy and abundant wildlife, you must have healthy and abundant habitat. And this habitat is facing a variety of threats, such as wildfire, invasive species, habitat fragmentation, and reduced water quality and quantity. There are several substantial challenges to addressing these threats. Two stand out. First is funding, or to, to be specific, a lack of funding. It takes money to manage Idaho's wildlife, to improve habitat, and to keep public access open, and to address the threats that I just mentioned. Unfortunately, as the problems and challenges are growing, the dollars to address these issues are remaining stable at best, or in some instances, declining. The model that we have built for funding fish and game and their vast responsibilities is not adequate for the coming generations. Second, one of the most troubling challenges that we are facing and that involve the problem of sustaining wildlife long term may be the next generation and their indifference. As the rest of the world goes, so goes Idaho. Statistics show that by 2050, 70% of the world's population will live in urban areas. Furthermore, data shows us that the younger generation has become more and more disconnected from nature and wildlife than prior generations. So what are we doing to ensure people can continue to enjoy wildlife and that wildlife continues to thrive and survive? We start with a plan. We look to areas where we can make a positive difference, areas with the potential to support salmon, elk, deer, moose, bears, and other animals. Then we look for partners and donors and figure out our shared goals. The Nature Conservancy has successfully worked with countless individuals and groups, including other conservation organizations such as Trout Unlimited, Ducks Unlimited, local, state, and federal agencies, businesses, landowners, and community groups. Whether it is acquiring properties and transferring them to the fish and game, as we did in the Tex Creek Wildlife Management Area and in the Craig Mountain Wildlife Management Area, or working on joint projects with our many partners, we have accomplished a lot in the name of conservation that benefits all types of recreation. Most of you are probably familiar with some of our preserves. Our first and most well-known preserve in Idaho is Silver Creek, with more than 150,000 visitors over the past decade. When the Nature Conservancy purchased Silver Creek, many in the community feared that public access would be closed off. People often hear the word preserve and assume that it means lands that are restricted from public access or locked up. We at the Nature Conservancy believe that people fall in love with wildlife and land because they can enjoy it and participate in it. And that means wherever possible, creating public access. For over 35 years, we've owned and managed the Silver Creek Preserve. Today, anglers and duck hunters, along with canoers, bird watchers, and other recreationists have access and the ability to pursue their interest in a beautiful, unique, and wonderful landscape. In addition to Silver Creek, the Nature Conservancy owns and manages several preserves throughout the state, and all are open to the public, ensuring that future generations can continue to enjoy scenic vistas, clean water, abundant wildlife, and world-class outdoor recreation. We are probably best known for our preserves, but in fact, what we've done to conserve large natural areas and their connections is taking place behind the scenes, not on preserves, but on working lands and with a diverse set of partners, partners that at first blush may not neatly fit into the label conservationists. What do falconers and the Nature Conservancy have in common? 
If you're like me, you may need a brief explanation of who or what a falconer is before you can answer that question. Falconers use falcons to hunt game birds. So what do we have in common with this group? A lot, it turns out. Turns out we both care greatly about ensuring that there remains a healthy population of sage grouse. We are also maybe some of the few people who know about a little known valley called Crooked Creek, an area sandwiched between Medicine Lodge and Birch Creek in eastern Idaho, a place that most Idahoans would have trouble finding on a map, an area that is remote, dry, difficult to find, but key to prime sage grouse habitat. The Nature Conservancy and our many partners have been working hard over the years to improve sagebrush communities, and our work received a big boost when we were contacted by the group of falconers about the great potential for conservation in this valley. Though we had different reasons for prompting our interest, we both wanted the same outcome. The valley restored to the point where it could support sage grouse, elk, and pronghorn. With the help of the falconry and sportsmen's community, the Nature Conservancy purchased one of the ranches in the valley and worked with partners to restore it. Together we tackled weed infestation, adjusted our water management, shifted fence locations, and adapted harvest dates and techniques to benefit wildlife. It's been a lot of hard work, but if you are ever over in the Dubois area and you have the opportunity to watch the sage grouse strut their stuff during their amazing spring dance, you'll know it's worth it. You will also be impressed with the hundreds of elk and pronghorn that you see moving through the ranch. This is a perfect example of where had we focused on the labels of falconer versus conservationist, we might never have seen the opportunity to work together, protect, and restore Crooked Creek. Next stop, the Meadowview Ranch, located on the south shore of Henry's Lake. Visitors from around the country stop by the ranch in the evening to enjoy the rodeo, complete with calf chasing, bull riding, barrel racing, and a barbecue. Students from the ranch's summer camp show off their newly acquired horsemanship and help out with running the event. Each year, millions of visitors flock to this area just 15 miles from the gates of Yellowstone to see the geysers, the bears, and to experience the Western lifestyle. Meadowview Ranch provides what they expect, but what most don't realize is that these ranches are at risk of disappearing and being lost to development. This has consequences, not just for the people who live and work on these ranches, but also for wildlife. You don't have to venture too, venture too far from the rodeo grounds to see the animals. Pronghorn, moose, mule deer, sandhill cranes. Many large mammals need ranches just like this one to move from Yellowstone National Park to their winter ranges. They are following millennial old migration routes. Migration routes every bit as long and fascinating as the wildebeest of the Serengeti or the caribou of the Arctic. Meadowview Ranch could have become just another housing development and one more barrier to the critical migration corridor that animals count on, except that the modal family didn't want that. They valued the scenic views, lifestyle, and wildlife that four generations had enjoyed, and they wanted to ensure that the next generations could enjoy them as well. So they worked to put together a conservation agreement now held by the BLM that will permanently protect their working ranch from development. The agreement will protect the wildlife habitat, the working cattle ranch, and this critical migration corridor. Sometimes keeping working lands productive and continuing to provide good wildlife habitat doesn't mean buying the land outright, but instead working with landowners on voluntary conservation agreements or easements. And in fact, this has become one of the most powerful, effective tools we use for wildlife conservation. What we know is that often some of the most ecologically significant lands and waters in Idaho are privately owned. Through these conservation agreements, landowners benefit by keeping their lands productive, from ranching to timberlands, and we all benefit from the food, water, and shelter that these working lands provide 
to wildlife and people. Take the Kootenai River Valley, north of Bonners Ferry along the Canadian border. You could think of this scenic valley as the habitat equivalent of an Oreo cookie. Forested mountains on one side, forested mountains on the other. A valley covered in wetlands and farms in between. It's the perfect place for large mammals to roam, and there is a broad coalition of people working on keeping it that way. If you hiked to a mountain peak in the Selkirks, or perhaps flew over an area in Small Plain, you would first notice the forest stretching out in every direction. You would see no county or state lines, no boundaries, no signs delineating ownership, just mostly expansive forests. That's where the wild things are. As you'd look closer, you'd also notice the agricultural valleys with farms, ranches, and small forest lands. That's where the wild things cross, from one mountain range to the next. As this view illustrates, conservation strategies in this landscape must address large forested swaths, but also critical valley properties that provide migratory paths, fawning areas, and hiding cover. That is why in North Idaho, in this landscape, farmers, ranchers, conservationists, forest investment companies, fish and game, and federal agencies are partnering to keep these working lands intact. Here again, had the partners focused on labels and seen people only as timber company, rancher, environmentalist, farmer, or bureaucrat, we would have missed the opportunity to join together as conservationists to protect these very important working lands that today provide local jobs, benefit the rural economies, and provide critical habitat and clean water to the wild things. Out in the Owyhees, where the vistas seem to go on forever and ever, are also expanses of blackened rangelands where wildfires scorch the earth. Of course, these days, don't, we don't have to look far beyond our smoky front yards to see the wildfires blazing across our state. These fires are fueled in part by dry conditions and in part from the inundation of weeds across our rangelands. Rangeland which makes up nearly half of the land in our state. Native species thrive in healthy rangeland and provide important habitat for both wildlife and domestic animals. In the Waihees, like elsewhere, change often starts with one relationship and grows to include many. Several years ago, one of our staff helped rancher Dennis Stanford get rid of the weeds on his remote ranch property. They even found some time to talk. Little did we know that this initial conversation would eventually result in a whole group of landowners and agencies coming together to form the Cooperative Weed Management Partnership. This group took a leap of faith, agreed to work together, and generously offered up their lands for piloting weed removal and post-fire rehabilitation approaches. The results? Fewer weeds, healthier rangelands, and a model for other participation throughout the state. Now if we travel to the center of the state, deep in the upper salmon basin, Chinook salmon and steelhead have returned to spawn and rear in waters where they have been unable to do so for over 50 years. Their return to the upper salmon was no small journey, not for the fish that traveled nearly a thousand miles from the ocean or for the people working together to make their return possible. In this part of the state for decades, water has been diverted from tributaries for agricultural use. Today, a diverse group, including ranchers, farmers, community leaders, the Shoshone-Bannock tribes, conservationists, and state and federal land managers are working to put water back into these tributaries and rivers by creating conservation agreements and finding more efficient ways to use the water. This means that streams until recently that were completely dry at critical times of the year now have water and the ability to support salmon. It also means that anglers in Idaho have a brand new place to fish on the Pasimaroy River. In a partnership between Glenn and Carol Alzinga, the landowners, the Upper Salmon Watershed Project, the Office of Species Conservation, the Idaho Department of Fish and Game, and the Nature Conservancy, 
anglers now have the first and only public access to catch the mighty salmon and steelhead on the main stretch of the Pasimaroy, an area that salmon can again call home. However, as everyone knows, conservation takes time and money. This is where the real heroes step in. And just like the stories above, you might be surprised at the profiles of some of these committed people. Ever been to Oakley, Idaho? This is not where you will find a Nature Conservancy preserve, but it is where you will find a friend of conservation, Gary, who for 58 years has run a successful rock quarry. At 79 years old, he loves to work, loves his rock quarry and operating heavy equipment. But he also loves the natural world. Camping, boating, and exploring the outdoors inspired him to make donations to conservation to ensure that the things he loves about Idaho can be preserved. Idaho citizens are lucky to have neighbors like Gary and other generous donors who have personally invested in the future of wildlife in this state. But even with the generosity of donors like Gary, as you look forward, there is a need for further investment in wildlife and wildlife management in the state. When you look at Fish and Game's responsibilities and mandates to manage all of the wildlife in the state, it's hard to see how the current funding model, which admittedly has served Idaho well for many years, will provide adequate revenue to do the quality job that Fish and Game has been mandated to do for both game and non-game species. To date, the responsibility for funding Fish and Game has fallen squarely on the shoulders of hunters and anglers and we owe this group much appreciation. But in light of the changing demographics and the many challenges facing wildlife, we must begin a conversation about how to increase this revenue stream. In looking to the future, the current funding levels are inadequate for the management of non-game species and may not even provide adequate revenue into the future for management of game species. As demonstrated from our stories above, Idahoans care very much about the future of wildlife in this state, and we believe they stand ready to find ways to contribute to habitat restoration and management of both game and non-game species. We don't know exactly what that funding model might look like, but we do know that it's time, the right time is right to have this conversation and begin planning on how we can all join together to meet the financial needs for the future. One of the main reasons we are facing future funding issues has to do with our changing population. The vast majority of us in this room probably chose to live in Idaho because we love the outdoors, the open space, and all the things that open space provides. Hunting, fishing, boating, camping, hiking, beautiful scenery. Unfortunately, the younger generation who has not been exposed to the outdoors may not share that same love or appreciation. In his book, Last Child in the Woods, Richard Love tells us that today's college freshman spends less than one hour a week in outdoor play or recreation. This is one-tenth of the time earlier generations spent outdoors. If this younger generation is not exposed to the beauty and wonder of nature, they can't be expected to care or care for Idaho's wildlife. The conservation of all resources that we have the privilege of enjoying today, all the open space, public access, and wildlife populations did not happen by accident. As David Keller once wrote, that the front remains as wild as it does has to do with the particular nature of its topography and weather. But its conservation has been anything but accidental. Rather, it has only been through the hard work and perseverance of highly dedicated people over the last century that the land and wildlife are in the shape they are in today. The protection of natural areas is just the first step in helping the next generation and our children and grandchildren to appreciate the beauty of Idaho. Beyond that, we need to give them the opportunities to experience this beauty firsthand. Take a second to think about where your love of wildlife came from. If you're like me, 
it probably started from someone in your life. For me, it was my parents. My dad, an avid bird hunter, introduced me to some of my earliest wildlife memories. My love of that wildlife only grew from there. Now I find that my husband and I make it a point to do the same for our two children. Unlike me, my children have been raised in the city. This has meant that we have had to make a more deliberate effort to get our children exposed to nature, wildlife, the outdoors, and all that Idaho has to offer. However, recently we have recognized that we can do even more to bring along that next generation. Whether it's inviting our son's friend down the street who has never been camping to accompany us on one of our outings, or inviting family friends to try fishing for the first time. These are things that we can and should do. These are experiences that will introduce a child to outdoor possibilities that they probably do not even know exists. In an effort to reach this next generation, we are reaching out to college students that might never have the opportunity to experience life in the outdoors. This past summer, the Nature Conservancy arranged for an intern from Atlanta, Georgia, to spend the summer helping to run Silver Creek. By the end of the summer, our intern Veronica learned to fish, identify species and sound, and most importantly, her firsthand experience taught her some priceless lessons. She wrote recently in one of her reflections, working at Silver Creek minimized my fear and maximized my comfort level when dealing with nature. I have never spent this much time in the outdoors in my life. There's no amount of talking that can make an impression that firsthand experience can. These are experiences that will inspire our children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, and neighbors to take care of what we pass on to them. Every single one of us has that responsibility, and we cannot accomplish this by sitting back passively. We need to make a concerted effort. The decisions we make in the next couple of years will affect our wildlife experiences for our lifetimes. But more importantly, they will set an example for our children. As the leadership of the Idaho Wildlife Federation said in 1938, we were hoping that our children and our children's children will inherit forests full of game and streams full of fish. If you reflect on the history of conservation, you'll see that the successes we've had in conservation happened because we put our differences aside and worked for the greater good. You have already taken the first big step in making this happen. You're here with us today. What I have come to know is that conservationists come in a lot of shapes and sizes, and most probably wouldn't label themselves as that, but they are. Some in canoes with binoculars, some with a falcon on their arch stretched arm, some with a weed sprayer in their hand, some with a branding iron and dirt on their boots, some with their hunting dog beside them in a stubble field, some who are heavy equipment operators, some who are trout fishermen, some who are cat fishermen, and yes, even some who are carp fishermen. But what we all share is a common goal of ensuring that Idaho is home to the wild things and that we have a bright future with forests full of game and streams full of fish. Thank you.